Can you touch on briefly what those eight elements are? Sure. And, um, you know, and I'll remind you that folks can also download the forms themselves from my website, jillchamberlain.com, so you can see it for yourself. Um, but I'll, I'll point out what the elements are. Um, so I do have a few moments in time. And by moments in time, I'm talking about the first scene and the last scene. So we're going to identify in the first scene what a character wants. Uh, and then we're going to have an, uh, a the next moment that I identify is what I call the point of no return. This is the big event that's going to push us into the main part of the story. It's the event that makes this movie this movie. Um, everything else on here is internal to the character. The point of no return is the one moment that's external to the character. It's the one thing that has to happen to them. Um, so, uh, so we're talking about Groundhog Day, right? So the, the, the point of no return is when he wakes up and discovers it's the same day again, right? And it should feel like it's this moment makes this movie this movie. Without that scene, you wouldn't have the movie Groundhog Day, right? It's absolutely essential. So it's, a, it's an important like moment like that that's going to drive the rest of the story. It's also external, you notice. It wasn't... The point of no return is never somebody decides to do something. There's an element of fate that is involved when we're looking at the point of no return. So of all the elements, it's the one thing that's external that had to happen to him. He could have not had that happen. It woken up and it was February 3rd, and then this movie wouldn't be this movie. But for whatever reason, he woke up and it was February 2nd all over again. That's outside of his control. Um, if we were going to look at the movie Tootsie, Sometimes people say, oh, the point of no return is when he goes to audition for the part. That's a choice, right? So the point of no return needs to be external to the character. So I would not identify it as he goes to audition. Um, what, and what you want to identify is the moment outside of his control. So the part where everything really changes is when... So he could have blown that audition, and he almost blows that audition. He comes very close to blowing it. But the female producer likes him, right? And at one point she says, I like him. I like her. We're going to hire her. And she leans over and says, you've got the part. I'm sending the contract to your agent. That's the point of no return. That Because that moment's outside of his control, right? That had nothing to do with his choice. He could have blown that audition. He almost bl did blow that audition. But that's the moment, boom, now we're in the movie known as Tootsie. Um, one, another thing I like to think of, a great example of this is um, the differences going from Act 1 and Act 2, is The Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz, Act 1, it's a black and white. Point of no return is she thinks that a tornado has lifted her house up and dumped her in the land of Oz, and boom, we're in technicolor. We want that feeling when we enter Act 2. We're in a whole new world. We ain't in Kansas anymore, right? So it's a whole new world that they're, they're facing. It's one thing Michael Dorsey decides to audition one day as a woman. It's another thing he's got to fool everybody 24-7 into thinking he's a woman. That's the main story. Or in Groundhog Day, he's now trapped in a cycle where every day is Groundhog Day. That's the main part of the story. Um, so there are two kinds of stories I, I, I talk about in the book, comedy and tragedy. Um, and these are not, these definitions don't come from, don't blame me if you don't like them, they're from Aristotle. Um, these are the original academic def definitions of comedy and tragedy. So when I say comedy, I'm not talking about a ha-ha comedy. I'm talking about an Aristotelian comedy. Um, and so an Aristotelian comedy, according to Aristotle, by definition, is where we have a protagonist who overcomes a flaw. So flaw is going to be the next element I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that they're, they're going to go through change, and then eventually they're going to have a happy ending. Um, structurally, we also have tragedies. A tragedy is going to be the opposite. So we have the same setup. We have the character wants something. They get it in a point of no return. But instead of going down, 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 and then coming up and having a happy ending, we're going to go in the opposite direction. They're going to go up, 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 up before they come down and have their sad ending. 95% um, of stories are going to be comedies, by the way. Oh, um, yeah, at least 95%. And by the way, this applies both to feature film and also to episodic television. Episod episodic TV works structurally just like little, each episode is a, like a little mini feature film. They have all of these eight elements, just like you find in a feature film. And forgive me, sorry yeah. for interrupting, but uh, so then the tragedy, it doesn't necessarily mean that like a death occurs, it just means that they don't change. Is that right? Or That's right. It oh, also okay. means they have a sad ending. 
Ah, okay. So they, they should, you know, it, it, uh, it, they have an unhappy ending typically, but it is, and it's not just an unhappy ending. You know, the way we colloquially say that, oh, that's tragic um, in life, it probably is not the same as a tragedy in Aristotelian sense. Because you might just say something sad happens to people and they have a sad ending. That's that's not a structurally a, a, a tragedy. Structurally, a tragedy is because of their own flaw. So it would have to be their flaw contributes in some way to their downfall. So they fail to change from that flaw, and that that's part of the downfall. And um, and so when we're looking at the protagonist as the the um, backbone, there are other elements of the story, but the nutshell we're looking at the protagonist as the um, uh, the main uh, backbone structurally to structure everything around it. Um, yeah, and then, like I said, another major part of it was the flaw. What's the character? The flaw is really the DNA of the whole story. It, it, it's a good, strong flaw as a writer is one of your best tools to make sure your story is strong. Because if you don't give your character a strong flaw, you're not really giving them anywhere to go. That change is what the story is really about. So if we took Sunset Boulevard, we know what Norma Desmond, her flaws are, but the screenwriter, what were his flaws? He was desperate, he was too naive, he was tricking her. Uh, yeah, so he's the protagonist, and yeah, is that he's cynical, right? He's cynical, he is just a no good writer, um, he's always putting himself down. He's putting down, you know, that voiceover. And that's one of the purposes of the voiceover is to, for us to hear that very cynical voice he has where he talks about you know, when he, he's reading Norma's screenplay and he says, you know, it's amazing just how bad, how bad, bad writing can be, right? That's all happening in voiceovers. That cynical voiceover, that cynicism is the part in that part of him that refuses to find hope that life could be different, that actually maybe he could find actual true love, right? He starts to think he's falling in love, but that cynical voice kicks up and gets in the way. He could have been happy. He could have walked away. That's why he makes a perfect tragic figure, right? It's, he's not a victim of circumstances. It's his own flaw that is his downfall. He could have walked away. She, you know, the love interest is when he brings her to the house, um, you know, she keeps saying, I've, I've not seen any of this. She's willing to completely forgive him for his sordid situation. Let's just go. Let's just leave. He won't let her. He won't let her do that. He forces her to see it and then pushes her away. So that cynicism and 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 that cynicism is the same thing that gets him to tell Norma, uh, reveal to Norma that where the truth about her fan letters, right? Those all the fan letters she's getting are actually being written by her ex husband, who's the uh, the live in servant now, right? Um, and, the, and that um, Cecil DeMille wasn't coming to see her, he just wanted the car, right? He still could have survived. He lost the girl, but he could have survived. He could have walked out of the door, fine, but he had to rub that into Norma Desmond's face, and that's why Norma kills him, right? You can't just let him walk away. That's why she shoots him in the back. So if he hadn't done that, if he just said goodbye and took a suitcase and gone, he would have lived. It's that, that tragic flaw of cynicism that he just can't believe that the world could, could be kind enough to allow him to have love and hope, even though everyone, you know, he's, he's been giving every opportunity of that. He's got this, you know, this wonderful girl who's completely forgives him this sordid situation um, and uh, wants to be with him despite everything. He won't have it. And the fact that the film opens with the ending, mm -hmm. is, is, that, is that something that we should be aware of? I mean, it, 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 does, it, it takes a skilled writer to be able to it do that. It is a skilled writer, yeah. Um, well, it's great when you can have um, a beginning and ending image that relate to one another. Um, I mean, this uses, actually, it's a very popular device now in television, I think, uh, uh, owes to Sunset Boulevard, the flash forward. Um, which was pretty unique in 1950 when Sunset Boulevard was created. I mean, it was kind of an anomaly, right? Where we had, it broke all the rules. We have a narrator, we have a dead narrator, um, and we have uh, a story that's in flashback. Those are kind of three things that, you know, that screenwriting 101, they'll kind of warn beginning screenwriters not to do. Um, doesn't mean you can't do them, because look how genius it is in Sunset Boulevard. Problem is, it's hard to live up to something as well as Sunset Boulevard does. Um, but the flash forward device of having um, uh, is become, I think, a really popular device—a uh, a device for using for television 
um, in that in television, sometimes you are, has a slower, so that point of no return I was talking about happens in um, a feature film close to the 25% mark in the running time. Feature film, sometimes it happens a little bit later. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in episodic television, it happens a little later sometimes. Because we're doing so much world building, we're building, you know, in a pilot episode for an entire 10, um, 10 hour series, um, this whole world. So sometimes it happens almost close to 50% in, uh, in the um, uh, running time. Can we continue on with the eight critical story elements? Yeah. So the story elements, um, uh, the next important thing to talk about when I talk about the point of no return, um, in the point of no, no return, the character gets something they want. They also get something they don't want. Um, and that's gonna be what I call the catch. So you get what you want, but with the catch. So Michael Dorsey gets a part, but he's gonna have to dress up as a woman. Um, uh, in Groundhog Day, Phil Connors only has to spend 24 hours in Puxatani, that was his want, but the, the catch is it's actually gonna be the same 24 hours done over and over again. So the catch is attached, so it's a problem. We can't just give our character what they want. Um, because that deflates conflict. So you're giving them something that they want along with something they don't want. And the catch is also could be said to be the perfect test of their flaw. So the um, flaw in you know, Phil Connor's flaw is that he's self-centric. This is the, that, the catch being that he's gonna stuck spending the same, same day over and over again. It's the perfect test of someone's flaw is that they're self-centered. Uh, in a comedy, it's going to end in the happy ending, but they're going to go down, 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 down uh, before. Because you've you got to hit rock bottom before you can make a change. Um, so it, keep in mind, in your typical ha-ha comedy, and your typical ha-ha comedy is an Aristotelian comedy. It's down, 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 down. Um, we're laughing as bad things are happening to the protagonist. They are not laughing. They are not having a good time in act two of a comedy. So they're going to go down, down, down until they're going to hit rock bottom, uh, what I call their crisis. The crisis has two requirements. Uh, one is it's their absolute lowest place. Uh, and then it is the other requirement is that the opposite of the want. Um, actually, Groundhog Day has a really interesting one in that he's actually finally spent, after being stuck there, he finally tells the truth to Rita, the love interest, about what's going on, and they actually have kind of a wonderful day together. But it ends in this very bittersweet moment where they're falling asleep, and he um, says, and the terrible worst part is, tomorrow you're going to think I'm a jerk again. And it, what is wonderful about it is this wonderful irony, and that's what we're setting up with the crisis being the opposite, this irony. He only wanted to spend 24 hours in Puxatani, now he wishes the day could last forever because tomorrow she'll think he's a jerk again. So it's, we're setting this delicious irony there. Um, then the next thing we're going to identify in the nutshell is we're now entering the act three. The beginning of act three is the climax of your movie. Uh, and the operative word that we're going to use, though, is the climatic choice. At the heart of a true climax, your protagonist is making a difficult decision. Um, so in Groundhog Day, his choice is to start, stop, to stop fighting it, to accept that he's there, and start trying to live every day for the fullest. And so he becomes a really good person. He starts, you know, doing nice things and saving the day and doing, thinking of others. Because what's the point in uh, living and, and trying to um, have uh, short-term gratitude? Uh, he's got to find a different experiment with a different way of living. So he actually starts becoming this town hero of this person who's the, known as this good guy because he's got nothing better to do. Um, and that finally breaks him free of the, the curse. And in the final step, the final step is the very last uh, structural element time-wise, the very last scene of the movie. Um, and now the character is going to come full circle. So if his uh, flaw was that he was self-centered, he's come full circle to its opposite strength that he now is um, selfless, and right? Because he's, he's been doing these things uh, for everybody in the town of Puxitani. And he um, uh, wakes up that final day and he's actually, it's become February 3rd. He's free of the curse and he actually wants to stay. Um, so those are the eight structural elements. And so, like I said, it's not just moments in time. This is not 
a beat sheet method. Um, they are, what's important is the glue. It's the, the, the structure that holds these pieces apart. It's the connection between these parts. These are not isolated moments in time. And this is a real easy way for writers. They can use it if they download the worksheets from my website. I also use them in my workshops and in my private consultation. We can see right on the piece of paper what's working and what's not. And if it's not working, how to adjust it by seeing that it fits, you know, what, what do we need to change um, in order to meet the requirements in order to, uh, to tell a story effectively.